us over the past days, you may notice that uh, Mega is now calling me LT Uncle and not LT Anna, uh, which depends on how young she thinks she is or how old she thinks I am. Uh, but it's nice to be back with you. And uh, I want to tell you that a sense of humor is part of the image of God in us and therefore learn to develop a sense of humor which does not deprecate others and which is a constructive way of using words by which you can um, help others to have a good laugh. In fact, um, those of you who are in Frank Bangalore, if you go to Vishranti Nilayam, the CSI guest house on the first floor, there is a painting of Jesus looking up towards the Father and laughing. I sometimes stand before that and I enjoy that uh, pencil sketch kind of painting. So try and have a look at it when you can. Now, let me frankly tell you that uh, the material I have for today is far more than what I can cover during one session. But I'm going to try and um, complete all the main points. But I'm also keeping the notes with me so that as I did in the case of our study of the Trinity, uh, I would uh, send it to Mega and you can get it from her, get the notes from her, whatever you want to um, look at. Now, I want to start with the incarnation with a very Indian situation. Now, one of the sad things about our country is idolatry. And I think all of us uh, really pray that God would bring us out of this bondage of the nation. And we must also notice that um, uh, this was a problem even in the first century when Paul goes to Athens and he finds people worshipping idols. He does not come down heavily on them, but he rather picks up the fact that uh, they are very religious or superstitious, whichever way you want to translate the Greek. Now, I want to suggest something to you in the light of the incarnation. I want you to go to John chapter 14 and look at verse 8. And I will not ask present to read except those passages which you think you really ought to listen to just to save time. Uh, you know, we normally stop with verse 6, Jesus to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But there are two other disciples who make some very insightful comments. And so we are going to Philip here in verse 8, who says to Jesus, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And I want to suggest to you that a desire to see God in visible form is a very natural desire. And therefore, when you come across a person who worships idols, in order to fulfill the desire to see God in visible form, we need to be careful that we do not come down too heavily on them. But what I have come to say, I'll say more of it when I do this addressing various views of God, is to find the original behind the counterfeit. Because every counterfeit has an original. You cannot have a, a 15 rupee counterfeit because there is no 15 rupee original. So we must begin to see that when we come across a counterfeit, we begin to look for the original. And I want to suggest to you that idolatry is the counterfeit of which the worship of Jesus is the original. Now, Jesus himself is referred to in two places, uh, in Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews 1.3, as the image of God. And the Greek word for image is icon, which can also be translated as idol. And therefore, what I'm saying is uh, perfectly uh, supported by scripture. And that is one of the things which makes us sensitive when we talk to people who believe differently, rather than coming down heavily. The, one of the problems that we have is we know how to preach where we don't have to listen to anybody, where, but we do not know how to converse where we have to listen to people and to interact with them. And one of the uh, indirect points on my agenda during all these sessions is to help you to go be good conversationalists for Christ and not just preachers. Uh, preaching has a place, but preaching uh, should never be a substitute for conversation. 
So I think that is something that we must understand. Uh, when we were in uh, Singapore for some years with Ravi Zacharias Ministries, and I was quite fascinated to see that many Chinese people in Singapore and Malaysia used to come to India to have a look at um, uh, Sai Baba because they believed that he was the incarnation of God. And of course, in classical Hinduism, if you have a good friend or you yourself have come from a classical Hindu faith, you would notice that um, Vaishnavites, those who worship Vishnu, uh, do believe that Vishnu took many avatars, many incarnations, nine incarnations to be exact, and they are waiting for the 10th incarnation, which is the perfect incarnation, the Purnavatar. And if you want to share Christ with the such people, please tell them you do not have to wait for the 10th Kalki avatar to come. He has already come. The perfect incarnation was already here on our planet uh, 2,000 years ago. So that is a way to connect our conversation. So uh, we are going to be looking at various theological, philosophical, and practical aspects of uh, uh, the doctrine of the incarnation. But this is something that we must understand. So it's very interesting that in the second commandment, second of the Ten Commandments against uh, idol worship, it says, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. And that's a very interesting phrase, of yourself, because the one whom God sends is not made by human hands, the one who is the image of God. In fact, one of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, there's a stone which is cut without hands. You know, it's a very interesting Old Testament picture of Jesus a stone which is not cut by human hands. It is not an idol, but it is the perfect, he is the perfect image of the invisible God. And therefore we have to be careful that anything which takes the place of God can be idolatry. Like for example, Paul tells the Colossians, chapter three, verse five, that even idolatry, even uh, greed is idolatry. So if our, um, and visible idols are so easily seen to be wrong, but invisible idols uh, can be more dangerous because they are not readily recognized as idols, but they take the place of God. Now, Christianity is not about principles. I've been saying that in different ways. And those of you who might have heard me on the series on Dauntless Pulpit, I don't know how many um, saw it. You can see it on YouTube too. Uh, talks have been put up on YouTube. Uh, this has been done by uh, three graduates of the Union Biblical Seminary, sitting in three different places, uh, who are doing this electronically. And um, one of the things I've said in the series of lectures entitled, How Do You Read Your Bible? And, um, and we are going to read the Bible again here. Uh, in regard to the incarnation in somewhat of a different way, in a narratival way, rather than a systemic way. Because very often in our, um, uh, in our uh, theological colleges and even in uh, organizations, for instance, the UESI with which I am closely associated, we teach doctrines more from a systemic perspective, systematized by what you read in the epistles by Paul. But we must remember that systems are arrived at by reflecting on the narrative that precedes the systematization. So when you study doctrines like uh, I plan to do today, as I did in, um, in the doctrine of the Trinity, I do not know how many of you are there, because we started not with the uh, system of the doctrine of the Trinity, but we talked about the narrative that led to the conclusion that within the one God of Judaism, there was a plurality. And the New Testament writers and theologians were struggling to accommodate the person of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit within the being of the one God. Remember that all the first Christians were Jewish people. And so in a similar way, we are going to look at the incarnation from a Jewish perspective uh, primarily, and um, just uh, a little bit of uh, 
explanation of the word incarnation because the Latin incarnare, carnal is the flesh. Uh, we use that even in the English. But incarnare is to be in the flesh. Incarnation is, of course, the coming of God in the flesh. Normally used only for Christian incarnation, but as many Christian phrases now have been appropriated by other people, even the phrase born again, which was a specially Christian phrase taken from John 3, is now being used even by sports people saying that Roger Federer is born again after retiring for some years and suddenly coming back and winning tournaments. So uh, let's be careful that when we use a certain word that now carries different meanings. And I want to particularly uh, talk to you, I've already mentioned to you in some context that, try, that we should try to read the Bible through as a narrative and using a copy of the Bible, which we do not underline, so that we do not get distracted by the passages we have highlighted. And if you read the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as a Jewish person first, uh, before an Indian Christian of the present day, you would notice gradually that within this human person called Jesus, who was human in every way, the Jewish disciples began to see Yahweh, Jehovah. And therefore they saw um, God incarnate before they came to the theological conclusion of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. Normally we put the cart before the horse, but if you go by the narrative, the narrative precedes the system, and therefore they begin to see that within this human person of Jesus, uh, there is um, the activity of the God of the Old Testament. Having said that, I want to give the three main uh, headings under which I'm going to deal with the subject. First is the narratival reality, the storyline that begins in the Old Testament and goes right through. And uh, reminding you once again that scriptures for the New Testament writers were the Old Testament. The New Testament books were still being written. So when you read scriptures in the New Testament, please refer, remember that they refer to the Old Testament. Of course, Jesus accepted the inspiration of the Old Testament, promised the inspiration of the New Testament, which is why we Christians take all the 66 books as the inspired scripture. But as far as the New Testament writers were concerned, they were referring to the Old Testament scripture when they referred to it. And they saw this primarily as the narrative of God's movement in history. Please never, never lose sight of that. Secondly, we are going to be looking at the theological necessity of the incarnation. And when I say theological necessity, it is particularly with reference to us humans. But what Jesus does on the cross is not only for humans, as we will see, it is for the whole of creation, which is one of the reasons why even creation stands redeemed at the end of the Bible. But we are going to look at the theological necessity as it would apply to us humans. And thirdly, the philosophical possibility of the incarnation. That which means that when we are claiming Jesus to be both divine and human, and not 50% human and 50% divine, like one of the avatars of Vishnu, Narasimha, half man, half lion, but a fully human and fully divine, are we committing a philosophical contradiction? And so we will look at those three. The third point would become necessary for people who continue to probe sincerely, sometimes insincerely at other times. But I think we have to be very clear that we are looking at a mystery and not a contradiction. And we will come to that later. Now let's start with the uh, narratival part. Why is narrative important? And now one of the things I say in the, my Dauntless Pulpit series is that transformation of character in us Christians is not going to take place by pure principles. Principles are abstract and they stand outside of you. 
You can believe in them, they are good principles, but principles in themselves will not be able to, uh, will not be able to transform you. It is in encountering the person behind the principle that we are transformed. And of course, the Indian Christian scriptures are quite unique because only in the Christian faith, a book and a person are both called the word of God. So the narrative becomes important because in the narrative, we want to encounter the person of Christ, the primary person of Christ, but secondarily, other persons. Uh, for example, the person of Joseph, who uh, probably long before the Ten Commandments, long before uh, Jesus talked about looking at a woman to lust after her, and personified uh, purity in the sexual area by not even remaining in the house uh, when Potiphar's wife was tempting him, but uh, running away, leaving a piece of incriminating evidence in her. So learn to read the Bible as a narrative. narrative uh, patterns, not principles. Uh, I call the word pattern, I coined the word, it's not a new word, but I'm putting into this word a meaning. A pattern is a principle enfleshed in a person. And that's what you see in the Bible. Ultimately, it is the word become flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, let me frankly tell you, um, if you looked at Genesis 1, of course, you were with me, most of you, or at least some of you know, the numbers have been uh, going up uh, quite a lot, uh, but because the uh, my talks on the incarnation are now available on YouTube, I suppose. Am I right, Mega? Uh, so those who are not there can have a look at it. But what I was trying to say is that when you look at Genesis chapter one, even the way it is phrased, it's very important. God says, "Let there be light. Let the land produce vegetation." Let water steam with living creatures. <laughs> Let the land produce beasts. Let air, um, birds fly in the air. But when it comes to us, he says, let us make man in our image. Now that's the significant difference because the environment for vegetation is the land. The environment for fish is the air. The environment for beasts is the field. Uh, sorry, in man for fish is the water, then environment for birds is the air, but the environment for us humans is God himself. So what you begin to see right from chapter one in the act of creation, and in chapter three, when God comes walking in the garden to commune with his human creation, God shows us what I call his imminence the fact that he wants to draw close to us. Now, um, I know that you have underlined Psalm 103 heavily, but if you turn to the next Psalm 104, um, you wouldn't have underlined anything in that Psalm because that Psalm goes above our heads normally. Uh, I call it the Passover Psalm because we don't find anything very useful in it. But it's very interesting that Psalm talks about uh, God, uh, he, he is the one who pours water into the ravens. He is the one who makes the grass grow. He makes uh, food for the cattle. And you will say that my uh, knowledge of botany and zoology and hydrology can explain all these things. Why should I say God is doing this? I'm saying that that is the Jewish understanding of God. That's the Christian understanding of God. That God is not only transcendent over creation, but he's also imminent in creation. He is acting through the laws of nature, through the order of nature. We do not worship nature, but we recognize God as acting through nature. Even at a time of a pandemic like this, it's good for us to remember that God is not somewhere outside our experience, but God knows what it means to suffer through um, something like this, even a simple thing like social distancing, how much we are used to meeting people and how we are now kind of sentenced to be sitting in front of our computers uh, in order to have a Bible study like this. So please remember, I'm giving you three references. Um, Psalm 104 is one. Psalm 8 is another, which we have already seen when we studied about humanity, particularly verse 5. 
you have made uh, humans a little lower than Elohim, which should have been rightly translated as God, but the Greek translation, the Septuagint said angels. But what I'm trying to say is God is imminent. He is wanting to relate to humans, and therefore um, he says that. And therefore our Jewish um, uh, friends and Jewish scholars as well would take even human creation in God's image as part as a kind of a messianic input. And if you go to Proverbs chapter 8, which is all about wisdom, you will notice that wisdom is also a picture for uh, the Jewish scholar of the Messiah. Not just intellectual wisdom, but uh, the Jewish understanding of wisdom always had a moral dimension. And if you have, uh, uh, I think Prasan here, you can help me. Uh, if you have an NIV, uh, footnote, do you have a footnote in your NIV? Uh, if you look at Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, can you read the footnote for fools? Yeah, the Hebrew words rendered fool in Proverbs and often elsewhere in the Old Testament denote a person who is morally deficient. Yes, the word fools in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, uh, re refers to a person not only intellectually deficient, but morally deficient. Wisdom always has a moral dimension. It's only we, because we are um, taught in a Western style of education, for us, um, IQ, intelligence is entirely intellectual, whereas not so for the Jewish people. And therefore, wisdom in the Old Testament, particularly in Proverbs 8, is a messianic uh, piece. And therefore, I want you to notice that this whole God wanting to share his relationality with us. I'm suggesting a way. Normally, we say to people, we are witnessing to them, we say God seeks to have a relationship with you. That is not wrong, but that gives the impression that God is running out of relationships so he's frantically running around looking for relationships. That's not true. We've already seen that God is a perfectly fulfilled relational being in the Trinity. But he's sharing that relationality with us so that we can become part of that fellowship, which is why the church becomes the perfect image of the Trinity. So we must remember that God is sharing his rationality with us and that is so often mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, um, let's read 2 Corinthians 6, 18, uh, Brasen, which is actually a fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, which I'll quote from you. I will be a father to him, and he will be my son. This is what God is saying to, uh, to Samuel about the choice of David, which will happen later. But uh, it's a very interesting messianic understanding, which is why the Messiah is often referred to the Old Testament and even the New Testament as the son of David. Now let's read 2 Corinthians 6.18. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now that's very interesting because what when Paul does it, he always does it with a twist. He takes an Old Testament which referred only to uh, to David and to the kingdom of Israel, and now he opens it to include the church because we have also become his sons and daughters because God's unique son, Jesus, became the unique person, the Emmanuel, as uh, we sang in one of our songs at the very beginning. Thirdly, now this is my third the notes. When we rebel against God, the first step God takes is to choose a pagan, probably a moon worshiper from Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham, with the intention of blessing all the families of the earth. I want you to read Genesis 12, verse 3 only. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, the peoples on earth uh, is really the word which is used is mishpacha, 
Mishpacha in the Hebrew means tribes. It can also mean species of plants and animals. And then he does not use the word um, earth. He used the word ground, Mishpachot Ha'adama. The species of the ground will be blessed by you. So if you read it that way, although I hold it not dogmatically, I've in fact referred it to a very famous British Old Testament scholar who taught in India for eight years. I have referred this to Dr. Christopher Wright to tell me whether Mishpachot Ha'adama can be even taken to mean that when God called Abraham, he wanted the descendants of Abraham, which includes the church as well, to be a blessing to the whole of creation, which is why the Bible also ends with the renewal of the whole of creation. Now, what we notice here, fourthly, is that Israel, instead of becoming the solution, becomes part of the problem. Let's look at two Old Testament passages. Isaiah 52, verse 5. No, sorry. We'll go back a little bit to my earlier point. We'll go to Genesis 18, verses 17 to 19. Genesis 18, verses 17 to 19. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. That is amazing because God is saying, you know, this is what finally introduces um, Abraham's intercession for Sodom and Gomorrah before God. And God is speaking to himself. He says, Abraham will become a mighty nation. He'll bring up his people. Uh, according to the law. And remember, law was not yet given. Uh, but it's interesting that in the book of Genesis, there is a reference to all this. And therefore, they will be a blessing to the earth. Now let's read Isaiah 52, verse 5. We'll just read one verse to save time. But there will be another um, reference I'll give you later. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord? For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. See, my name is constantly blasphemed, God says, among his people. He says the same thing in Ezekiel 36, 22. So the people whom God chose in order to be a blessing to the nations. I'm following the narrative. This is the way to read the Bible, not just to look at what the Bible says to me, but what the Bible says. In fact, I've been recently listening to an Old Testament scholar, Professor John Walton. He says the Bible was written for us and not to us. And that's one of the reasons why when I read the Bible, don't jump to what the Bible is saying to me before deciding what the Bible is saying to the people for whom it was written. That is the right way to interpret the Bible. One of the reasons we have a lot of uh, wrong teaching, particularly in our state of Tamil Nadu, is because we jump this one step and go straight to what the Bible is saying today in today's English and today's language, and we land in all kinds of problems. And so this is what God is saying about his own people. You are the ones I chose in order to be a blessing to the whole world, but here I find that you are becoming a person, a problem. And now we have some sections of scripture. I am in a fix. Um, just giving you two references for present read. Isaiah 59, verse 16. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Now, wait a minute before you proceed to the next passage. One of the things you must say, uh, you must recognize, is that God wanted Israel to be the intercessor. Remember, in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, uh, God, through Moses, is telling his people, you are a kingdom of priests. That means you are kings and queens, representing me to creation. You are priests and priestesses, representing creation to me. But that's where we failed. That's why the people of Israel failed. 
So what does God say? He becomes his own intercessor. You know, that's where what we now call the uh, substitutionary death of Christ takes its shape in the Old Testament. Of course, we can always go to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, but I deliberately did not refer to that more obvious passage, but to less obvious passages. Let's look at Isaiah 63 verses 2 and 3. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone for from the nations. No one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. The well, blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. You know, this is actually a quite a bloody picture. It looks as if God is pronouncing judgment and his garments are splattered with, of course, uh, the grape juice, uh, which again is a grape of God's wrath, so to speak. You have those pictures, plenty of them in the Old Testament. Now let's go to Ezekiel 22, a passage which we are, which, with which we are very familiar. Verses 30, 31, Ezekiel 22. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. So I'll pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my pure anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now, when we read this passage as Christians, we say that at that time there was no one found because ultimately Jesus himself becomes that one who bridges the gap, who stands in the gap, so to speak. So that is the general teaching of the Old Testament. Uh, I'm going through it like an express train, but I want you to slowly read these passages when you happen to come across them and begin to soak in what we are talking about. Now, we have passages. Um, these are the 12 chapters of Isaiah, 42 to 53. Um, they're all called servant passages because in every one of these chapters, you have reference to ser servant and which uh, the Jewish people had a difficulty to interpret because they knew that they were servants of God because God chose Abraham and through Abraham, David, and they are descendants of David. So they are going to be the means of blessing to the world. But here suddenly, and therefore, they have no problem in translating servants in the kind of a plural, in a corporate sense. The nation of Israel is the servant. But they, when you come to chapter 53 of Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, Jewish interpreters have a problem. They actually say, uh, if you go to a Jewish country, they say, this is the suffering of the land of Israel, of the nation of Israel, rather. Uh, but obviously, it is a reference to an individual person. And of course, they do not know how to translate this, which is where their own understanding of their own narrative is not yet complete. Then we come um, to the next point, which of course is Genesis 3, verse 15. God had told the woman, um, and of course he told the serpent, that you will uh, bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and the woman, the seed of the woman, Will, um, will crush your head. And those of you who remember this amazing scene in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Um, Mel Gibson, of course, is quite amazing. I do not know how many of you know that uh, this movie uh, begins by from Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgression. And while filming it, the hand that crucifies uh, the uh, Jesus actor is actually the hand of Mel Gibson. He kind of brought in his own experience of Christ in the making of this movie. And I think we uh, need to begin to see that here he, um, he brings in this, uh, the seed of the woman crushing the head of the servant, ahead of the serpent, to the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus gets up from praying to the Father and ultimately saying to the Father, let your will be done, not mine, he then crushes the serpent in the movie, which I thought is quite an interesting way of uh, depicting this. 
And therefore, let's read Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the set time has uh, had fully come, God sent a son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now that's interesting, born of a woman, born under the law, because the agenda behind Paul's writing the letter to Galatians is something different. It is to discourage uh, Gentile Christians in Galatia not to be persuaded by the Judaizers. Uh, they are Christians, but who insisted that you must follow all the customs or the laws of uh, being a Jew, not eat with a Gentile, have yourself circumcised and so on. Uh, so it's in that context he's saying, but he's definitely saying that it is uh, the seed of the woman. And later on, as you know, he would say that it is the seed of Sarah, not of Hagar, which means the child of promise. And that's how we, we flow into the narrative. So it is the seed of the woman and then we come to Isaiah 7, 14. We already sang that song. Emmanuel, Emmanuel in Hebrew means with God, uh, with us, God. That's how the Hebrew runs. Emmanuel means with us. El is God, God with us. And that's mentioned in Matthew 1, 23. But you do not see uh, Jesus being called as Emmanuel elsewhere in the Gospels. And that is uh, very significant. But I want to do one thing here. I think we did it when we did the doctrine of the Trinity, but we have many more people now. So we are going to do a one quick comparison. And the second comparison will be in the notes that uh, I'll be sending you. Uh, the first one is Psalm 107, verses 23 to 29. Psalm 107, verses 23 to 29. Uh, should I read it? Yes, please. Some went out on the sea in ships. Uh, they were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In, the, in their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. Okay, now you turn to Matthew 8, and you read from 23 to 27. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Please remember that the Jewish disciples of Jesus had not been to theological schools, but they were very conversant with the Old Testament. And they knew here, uh, Jesus did not say, I will pray to the Father. Jesus did not say, let us fast and pray. He speaks straight to the waves, Shh, keep quiet. And the waves fall silent. And they begin to say, what kind of man is this? Because in the Old Testament, it was to a Jehovah they cried, and he still the storm to a whisper. Here we are speaking to this human Jesus, and he stills the storm to a whisper as well. So what we are seeing here, we are seeing God active in the human person of Jesus. Let me go on saying the human person of Jesus, because we Indians do not name our sons as Jesus, which is a pity. We don't mind calling them Joshua, but Jesus is somehow a divine name. I want to tell you that Jesus and Joshua are exactly the same. And if you go to countries where Spanish and Portuguese languages are spoken, or you go to the Philippines, which was under Spanish influence for some 400 years, you will find the whole place crawling with Jesuses. Because Jesus means a human side of Jesus. Jesus is not a divine name. Please remember. Even when Paul quotes that in Philippians 2, therefore God has given him a name which is above every name, that at the very human name of this particular Jesus, 
every knee shall bow. That's how it's meant to be read. Not any Jesus, but this particular Jesus. God has given him a name. Same thing is what Peter says in response to uh, the mocking they, uh, they get on the day of Pentecost when they speak in tongues. He says, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so what we are saying is, please remember the humanity of Jesus in the narrative must precede the divinity of Jesus to which we draw our conclusions later. Which is why I'm saying the narratival theology pretty much should precede uh, systematic theology. Okay. I'm going to skip another important point, but we must also remember that Jesus is the son whom Jehovah calls out of Egypt. Now, uh, please read Hosea 11 verse 1 and then Matthew 2 verse 15. Hosea when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Well, when you read Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son, it's obviously a reference to God bringing his people Israel out of Egypt. Now read Matthew 2, verse 15. Where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. Well, Matthew does a real amazing Old Testament reference. Because here Jesus, as a baby, is carried by his parents to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod, who murders all the boys up to two years of age. And then when he comes back, again in response to a dream given to Joseph, Matthew quotes Hosea 11 as if Jesus is the one who's coming back from the captivity. Now I'm going to probably shock some of you. All of us know that Jesus died for us. He died as an atoning sacrifice for us. I mean, uh, John makes it very clear. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. If any man sin, uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. No doubt about that. But did you notice that Jesus wanted his death to coincide not with the Day of Atonement, but with the Passover? And that is something which is hugely important. See, we will not fully recognize this unless we get into Jewish shoes and we read the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, first from a Jewish point of view. But before that, I want to ask uh, Prasant to read Colossians 1 verse 13. For he has rescued us uh, from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Now, we must remember here that um, Paul, actually, Colossians is a letter written to a Gentile group. But Paul is very clear in saying that we are being rescued from the kingdom of darkness, which is a picture of the kingdom of Pharaoh in the Old Testament, and brought into the kingdom of his dear son, which is the land of Canaan for the Old Testament readers. So that is the picture. Now, I'll tell you why this becomes so important, because, and you have to listen to me carefully here, from Deuteronomy 30, verse 3, to Zephaniah, verse chapter 3, verse 20, we are not going to read this, we have no time at all, there are 20 references in the Old Testament. I've just given you the oldest and the latest um, Deuteronomy 30 and Zephaniah 3, where the phrase restore the fortunes occurs in the NIV. But restore the fortunes, if you actually read in the original Hebrew, which will actually mean to return the captivity. Now, what I'm trying to say is even after some Jews returned to Jerusalem at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, and even at the time of Jesus, and uh, because we do not consider the Apocrypha as a part of inspired scripture, but two books of the Apocrypha, first and second Maccabees, uh, give you certain in, um, historic points because the Jews still considered themselves to be in exile. Although they were physically living in the land of Israel, they were still being ruled by foreigners. 
So they were actually looking forward to a deliverance uh, which will come through the Messiah. And that's very, very interesting. And that is why Jesus, remember, he had to speak within the context of his people. He wants his death to coincide with, um, uh, with the Passover. And we are going to stay on this a little longer. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Now, um, where are you, Mega? Now, I want to know whether, what is the time like? We have another 10, 12 minutes enough. But can I take a little longer? Yes, please. Um, or I may have to stop abruptly. I don't want to do that. Um, you know why now this uh, Jeremiah 29 uh, verse 10, although verse 11 is our favorite verse, uh, I have uh, a future and a hope and all that. But the point here is the seven years. Now, if you go to Daniel 9, we are not going to read the whole chapter, but when you get the time, maybe uh, this evening you read through it. Daniel is looking at Jeremiah's letter to the captives and he comes across these seven years. And so he fasts and prays. And then he receives a very amazing vision from God. And I'm going to ask a person to read Daniel 9, verses 20 to 27. 20 to 27. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for which you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for you people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War okay. will continue until the end and desolation have been decreed. Okay, thank you. You know, uh, this vision says, Daniel, it's not 70 years. It's 70 times seven, uh, which is about 490 years, which interestingly is a time when the Messiah, the anointed one, will be cut off and will have nothing. And that is going to be the time of the end of iniquity, the coming in of everlasting righteousness. And it therefore coincides with the crucifixion of Jesus. So the return of the exile is not when people returned after the Cyrus published the order that the Jews can return, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, and if you read those two books, they are very sad books because both of them have some abrupt endings. Uh, because people were not satisfied. Of course, they were in their own land, but it was not the same case. And that was true even at the time of Jesus. Now, Jesus here very pointedly chooses the Passover to coincide with his crucifixion. Because this was going to be the return, real return from exile, where we will be rescued from the kingdom of darkness, as Paul puts it in Colossians 1.13 and will be brought into the kingdom of God's own dear son. So please take that, and that is a hugely important interpretation of the Old Testament within the uh, interpreting framework of the Lord Jesus himself. And therefore, we have a number of other things. We have the everlasting kingdom promised to David, uh, which is really what uh, the angels announced to shepherds in Luke 1.69.
he has raised up a horn of uh, salvation for us in the house of his servant David. These are the, no, no. With this day is born a savior, which is Christ the Lord. I think I've got my reference wrong. Or oh, it should be Luke 2. Uh, can you get the passage of uh, the angels appearing to the shepherds? Yeah. Yeah, it's Luke 2 11, please. Yeah, sorry. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah the Lord. Yeah. No, he is the child who's born according to Isaiah 9 6, but he is also. Christ the Lord. And that is the word which is coming to the uh, Jewish shepherds who are watching over the flocks by night. Now, I'm going to, unfortunately, uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, only Sudan and Mega will have to decide because I have so much more to complete. I, what do you say, Sudan? Now, we have a lockdown tree. We've got a new logo and all that. That's Should right. we have uh, incarnation part two or something? And we, we stop that? here and get some questions. Can we do that? I think yeah, that. I, I don't mind doing that. That will be better. Yeah. Uh, because you will. Uh, it will need another at least a, four, a half an hour, more more than half an hour, right? Yeah. Uh, another full session like this, so that people who have tuned in today, what have you fixed for tomorrow at this time? Tomorrow, Finney is talking. Oh, Finney Prem Kumar, correct. So let me do one thing. Uh, before I do this, um, addressing other worldviews, uh, on that day, why not we continue? How can Jesus be both God and man? Part oh, can two. Can I ask Finney and push it later so that you can do it tomorrow? If Finney is willing to do that, that will be ideal. I'll ask him. I think uh, I'll ask and him. If he can take my Thursday session okay. and I take his Monday session, uh, that will be wonderful now Finney's that we are all listening. electronically connected. Finney is actually listening to you right now. I'll ask him right oh, now. Are you? <laughs> Finney, you will have to decide whether your calendar is free. Finney, can you come online? He has to be unmuted. Finney, I unmuted yeah. you. Yeah. Finney? Okay, uh, sure. I'll check, it out. I'll check it out. Now we can go. Sure, sure. I think I could hear him. Uh, Finney, is it okay for you to take sure. Thursday? Uh, of course, Uncle. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah. Sure. Because it'll be good if we uh, continue it on consecutive days. Uh, sure, I would sure. uh, hate to break here. Because no I did not... Um, yes, Finney, you wanted to say something? Uh, no problem, Uncle. Okay, no problem so at all. Yeah. And we can have the world view sometime next week. Uh, you know, hurry. So, so then we'll have this tomorrow. We'll continue. When I will go through some of these narratival part, I don't want to um, kind of run away from it just because of time. I think it's very important that we uh, get the big picture here, which incidentally will also teach us how to read the Old Testament. Uh, not simply as a fulfillment of predictive prophecies. I see, I want you to get hold of this. Surely, I mean, I have known a personal friend of mine from a Hindu background who came to Christ just because of the fulfillment of prophecies. So that is fine. But are, we are looking at something much bigger than fulfillment of prophecies. We are looking at a flow of a continuous narrative. And this is exactly where we place ourselves now 2,000 years after Jesus. The narrative in one sense is still continuing in our lives. So when we begin to read the Bible in this way, it becomes far more refreshing. So please uh, try and do this. And um, what we will do in the remaining minute or so, why not we have some questions out of the top of your head? If something that you heard from me has completely shaken you to the very roots, uh, I would like to listen to questions like that. There are a huge number of things on the chat. They are mainly uh, quotations from scripture. Thank you. Mm. Friends, we have a slight change in the way we do the Q&D. We have disabled chat except to those who are in the, uh, 
in the co-hosting panel. So okay. friends, we, uh, we will have the questions. You would find a participant name as 01 Q&A co-host. So do route in your questions because it's going all over the place. We are not able to bring it together. So we will put it forth to LTNR. So you have a participant name called Q&A. You can post your questions there. It will immediately uh, be uh, asked to LTNR. Before that, Anna, could you just uh, close and pray the session for today? By that time, we will get it. Wonderful, yeah. Lord Jesus, we worship you because there is no one like you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, because in you, your Jewish disciples and even the Jewish detractors saw the reality of Jehovah. And that is how we saw God incarnate in you. Till much later, by the inspiration of your spirit, the writings of Paul and Peter and John, we came to the conclusion that you are the second person of the Trinity who is incarnated as the human Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to look at your word in this way, because you are the, the incarnate word, and the Bible we are reading is the written word. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that as we read your word, we will encounter you, we will meet with you. And through that meeting, uh, we in our character, both as individuals and as a community, will be changed from one degree of glory to another. We thank you. Amen. I, I want to thank Brother Finney uh, for graciously adjusting this because uh, I am not a bull in a china shop normally, but yesterday as we were coming to the end of time, I realized that uh, we should have one more session. And if we have it immediately after the previous one, that would be helpful to the audience. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, Brother so kindly consented. And I find that he's going to have two sessions together as well. It may be an advantage for him also. Now, I, what I want to do is to briefly tell you the three main topics that we are looking at uh, from is the narratival reality. And I'm repeatedly saying this to people everywhere, that Christians must begin to look at the scriptures narratively and not simply as a collection of principles, because that's where we really encounter Christ. So we are going to look at this narratively. Uh, and of course, I covered most of it yesterday. So I'm going to go over a few points only. And then we will come to the theological necessity of why this person who comes from God has to be both divine and human. And, and of course, thirdly, we look at the philosophical possibility that there could be someone who could be 100% God, 100% man. That will be partly apologetics, which our brother Finney's anyhow going to be doing. I'm just going to apply it only for the incarnation. Now, I want to, one of the persons asked a question yesterday, which is very important. Why did I mean, um, Jesus uh, deliberately coincides his crucifixion with the Passover? And Passover, if you look at Exodus chapter 12, has not got anything directly to do with atonement of sins. And so that's a very important point. So in my notes, which I'll be sending to Mega uh, shortly after our session today, uh, I have made some modifications. Uh, one is the fact that God uh, comes into the garden in Genesis chapter 3, and many Jewish scholars and Old Testament scholars consider that that is the first example of the temple, where God wants to share his Trinitarian relationality with his human creatures. And of course, uh, God finds that we have already um, declared rebellion against him. And so what he does is in the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 to 7, he has arranged a system of sacrifices. And in chapter 23 of Leviticus, he has a system of festivals, one of which is the Passover. Atonement is another one, and you have uh, several others. You can read through that. 
But what happens is when Jesus decides to give himself up for us, he collapses all sacrifices into one. And I have no time to develop that, but keep that at the back of your mind. Secondly, as uh, Sneha's um, uh, song just now was about, uh, we want to look at one other passage, a point I'll explain a little later. What we need to see first is God being fully present in this human being. You know, all the name Emmanuel is given in Isaiah 7, 14, Matthew 1, verse 23. You do not find anyone calling Jesus as Emmanuel. We only name our sons as Emmanuel, but no one addresses Jesus as Emmanuel. But why is this name important? Because they saw in this human Jesus, the God of the Old Testament fully present. Please let me say that again. It's very important because we normally think of, we normally first think of God the Son becoming human. But that is historically a later analysis that we did. But historically, what took place is this man Jesus, with whom the disciples walked for three and a half years, and they found that the God of the Old Testament was fully present in this man. So we are going to look at. Uh, two passages, if present can lead, it, lead them for me. The first one is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, uh, verse 13, 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So the Ancient of Days is God, and he gives glory to the Son of Man. You should realize Isaiah 42, verse 6, for example, God does not share his glory with anyone else. But with this Son of Man, he shares his glory. Now I want you to look at a New Testament passage, how this particular uh, statement of, uh, of the prophet or of Daniel is fulfilled in Jesus' trial before the high priest. We are going to turn to Matthew 26. We are going to start with verse 63b and read to verse 66, the second part of verse 63. Verse the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are Messiah, the son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. Now, I want you to recognize this. Look at the question that the high priest puts to Jesus. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus answered, yes, and you will see the Son of Man. And that's what uh, Sneha was singing in that song. Uh, but I do want to make a slight correction. Two persons are not combined in Jesus. That would be schizophrenia, will be deserving of psychiatric treatment. It was two natures which were combined in one person. Uh, theologians, when they cannot explain something, like scientists, they'll give it a nice name. And the nice name they have given to this combination is the hypostatic union of the divine nature and the human nature in the person of Jesus without any confusion. And that is very important. But what we are actually able to see here in this particular scene, the high priest is not supposed to tear his robes uh, at the drop of a hat. He can only tear his robes at the death of a very close relative or when, uh, when blasphemy is committed in his presence. So it's very clear to, uh, to the uh, high priest that Jesus was claiming to be God. Now, one of the things, if you have heard of Zakir Nayak, he would ask us to show verses, show me a verse where Jesus says, hello, I'm God. 
You do not have any verses like that, thankfully. But the Jewish people knew exactly what Jesus was claiming to be. And that's one of the reasons I've been repeatedly telling you that when you read the Bible, first read it, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, first as a Jewish person, a Jewish Christian, then you read it as a Christian of today in India. And that will help you to avoid misinterpretation. It will also help us to see what exactly was meant. So that is uh, another point which uh, I wanted to repeat, which I mentioned last time yesterday. It was a reference to the stilling of the storm. And Jesus stilling the storm as a human being reminded the disciples of a passage in Psalm 107 where people cry out to Jehovah during storm on a ship. And Jehovah stills the storm. And so you begin to see that the theology of the incarnation develops in the minds of the first Christians, more, both um, more by historic encounter than by theological reflection. So please keep that in mind. Then I want to mention another very important aspect. And this is uh, something mind blowing. It will take some time for it to sink down into our ears. Let's turn to Matthew 5, verses 39 and 40. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's given to uh, the disciples. So there is um, um, no doubt about that. But look at this statement. 39 and 40, right? Uh, 39 and 40, yeah. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take, you, take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now, Mahatma Gandhi took this as the basis for the Satyagraha, where you use nonviolent means to get things done for you. But if you carefully read this passage, Jesus is not saying that you are turning the other cheek so that you can achieve something. He says, let evil take its course. Do not resist evil. Now, that is a very hard saying. I want to tell you that. But that is at the heart of the atonement. You know, Jesus actually lives it out. Because when you react to evil with evil, when you respond to violence with violence, you start a descending spiral of violence for which there is no end. Something of what we are seeing in our country is hatred intentionally or unintentionally started and responded to by hatred, and it creates a Frankensteinian monster of hatred, which you simply cannot stop. No government action can stop it. Uh, but here what Jesus is saying, that by not resisting evil, he is going to stop this downward spiral of violence. But do you know what he is intentionally, um, incidentally, uh, achieving, he is exhausting the force of all the evil in the universe. You know, when Paul can later say in uh, uh, Romans 5, for example, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and we have all those of us who have come to trust in uh, him have applied that statement to our personal salvation. But behind this is this huge picture of Jesus not resisting evil, and because of which he exhausts the force of evil in his own person. That's what exactly happens on the cross. And so we must understand that uh, at the heart of Jesus' ministry of reconciliation is not only bearing our sins upon him, which is absolutely true, very important for each of us, but he's also resisting all evil, and in so doing, he's also renewing the whole of creation. We saw yesterday that when we walked out on God, we dragged creation along with us. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, creation is groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, borrowing the picture from Genesis chapter 3. And now I want to, um, uh, him to read two passages from Paul's uh, ep uh, episodes, Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. 
I also want you to notice that, um, let's read Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the death of Christ on the cross is for reconciling everything, all kinds of groaning, including our sins, uh, which of course are most important to God and to us because we are the only creatures made in God's image. But in so doing, uh, Jesus is reconciling all things to himself. So it's not surprising that at the end of the Bible, we have this amazing picture in the last two chapters, um, the new creation. If you're interested, you can go to YouTube search and you can either type out my name or the title of my three talks given in Chennai many years ago called From a Garden to a City. It's essentially a study of the first two and the last two chapters of the Bible, because unfortunately for us Christians, our understanding of theology begins with Genesis 3, the fall, ends with Revelation 20, the judgment, and we leave out the first two and the last two chapters of the Bible, which is why the good news is delinked. It is not connected to reality. So please keep that in mind. And then we are going to something very important here, which I mentioned. For those of you who attended uh, my session on the, uh, on the Trinity, we will make a contrast between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus, which I think is very important because it is because of that that the new creation is coming into existence. We, we must remember that our resurrection is linked to the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus is part of the renewal of the whole of creation. And I'm not going into passages, you can read them for yourself. I'm going to send the notes to Mega and you can collect it from her. In John chapter 11, you read about Lazarus' resurrection. I'll give you the verse numbers if you want to know down. John chapter 11, verses 38 to 44. You find that uh, Jesus comes to the grave. He asks the stone to be removed. And after Lazarus is called out, his um, grave clothes have to be removed. But if you looked at those two pieces of evidence in uh, Matthew 28, where the stone is rolled away from the mouth of Jesus' grave, but we do not see Jesus coming out. The angel tells the women he's not here. He's risen. The stone is rolled away to let us in. Peter and John go into the grave, and what do they find? They find the grave clothes exactly in the same position as the body was. And so his uh, resurrected body had gone through the clothes, gone through the stone, come through the walls of the upper room, and appeared to the disciples. So that is going to be the nature of our resurrection body. And as far as our study of the person of Christ is concerned, Death on the cross was not the end. But why did Jesus have to choose this ignominious, shameful death? Let's go to Genesis 3, uh, verse 16. Uh, and I'm going to quote this from memory. Uh, this is what God is telling the woman, the second part of a statement. The first part is about uh, her pain in childbearing. He says to her, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, if you asked any wife uh, how that statement sounds, she would probably respond saying that it uh, seems to be a combination of good and bad. Desire doesn't seem to be a, uh, anything bad, but this, his ruling over me is something I don't like. Uh, but I want to tell you that even the word desire has a negative connotation. If you went to the next chapter, 4, and look at verse 7, God uses the same words when he speaks to Cain before he murders Abel. Sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must master it. You know, this word desire actually in these two contexts um, actually uh, is a manipulative desire. If you want me to translate that statement in today's English, God is telling the woman, you will use your feminine charm to control and manipulate your husband. 
and the dumb macho man will not know how to respond except by dominating you. And if you have small children, uh, four years, five years, they know exactly how to manipulate one parent against the other. So one crucial uh, dimension of the cross, and I'm going to put it in uh, shocking terms, God choosing to lose control over his creation and allow his creatures to crucify his son. Please note that. God had to take that extreme step because this desire for control is so deeply entrenched in us. Even I, uh, so then has asked me to speak to worship leaders. One of the things I think about worship leaders, when they wish you the first thing in the morning, you say good morning, they, he says good morning, and you don't respond enthusiastically, he would say good morning loudly, which is also a kind of control if you really look at it. Uh, but well, I think it's a kind of legitimate control, but control is part of our lives. Even in good things, we want to control people. But the only difference is the Holy Spirit of God, when he wants us to lead us, he doesn't control us. That's what Satan does. But that's what addiction does. Addiction is control. And that is uh, Satan's instrument of manipulation, which is why when we uh, fall into the trap of Satan, we end up manipulating people. In fact, long ago when I was a, a new Christian, someone told me, Jesus taught us to love people and use things. We love things and use people. And that's one of the reasons for many years I have not even prayed to God, Lord, use me. Because God is not one who wants to use us. Uh, that is a very fallen term. And I think God wants to live through us, work through us, speak through us, but not use us in the sense we use other people. But we have to learn to use things and learn to love people. Now look at how Satan is confused by the cross. Because Jesus takes the step of going to the cross, Satan does not know what to do with Jesus. The cross is a kind of a catch-22 for, uh, for Satan. He does not know whether to send Jesus to the cross, which is what he ultimately does, by entering Judas Iscariot, John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 2. But earlier, when Jesus starts sharing uh, the necessity of his sufferings, this is in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter takes him aside and says, uh, that should not happen to you, how does Jesus rebuke Peter? In a very uncharacteristic way. He says, get behind me, Satan, because that was a satanic mindset. And so please remember later when we come to the conclusion of the session, one of the, um, you know, the implications of the incarnation for us Christians is to follow him without controlling people, leading people, not controlling. Uh, the shepherd picture we uh, sang that song uh, maybe yesterday. You know, the Palestinian shepherd led from the front. For us, Indian Christian shepherd is a bad example because our shepherds drive from behind. But the Palestinian shepherd led from the front. So whenever you read a reference to shepherd in the Psalms or in um, Jesus in um, John chapter 10, you must picture a Palestinian shepherd who leads from the front, setting an example, not by controlling people. So that is essentially what actually happens. But finally, I just want to skip a few other things. Uh, please turn with me to Romans chapter 15. And this is an interesting passage, uh, which will throw light on many other passages. Uh, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and this particular chapter uh, is meant for the Jews and the Gentiles to live together in peace. And he does it in a strange way. And I want present to read this from uh, Romans 15, verse 18 to 13, 8 to 13. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, the Gentiles uh, might... Stop for a minute. God. Jesus became a servant of the Jews. That will explain some of the things which are very difficult in the Gospels. 
For example, in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus sends out the disciples, he says, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Syrophoenician woman um, comes to him to ask healing for his daughter, he responds rather brusquely, saying that it is wrong to take what belongs to children and throw it to the dogs. So if you want to really understand some of these difficult sections of the Gospels, you have to see that Jesus commits himself to the Jewish people, then read on further. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I'll sing the praises of your name. Again it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is an amazing passage. All of us here, we do not belong to the Jewish race. One of the clear teachings of the Old Testament law was that a Jew should not even eat with a Gentile. And God has to bring this giant of a man, Paul, into the picture in order to say that even in the Old Testament, Jesus, by confining himself deliberately to the Jewish people, is actually opening the door for the Gentiles. And there are four references to the Old Testament in that passage in Romans 15. Uh, you open, read, and uh, reflect on it. Now let's read from 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and through him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now please remember, Corinthian church is a predominantly Gentile church. And what Paul is referring to is to the promises to Abraham, the covenant to Abraham. Now he says they become applicable to us Gentiles. It becomes yes, and it becomes Amen to us. So that is not accident. So when we now claim the promises of God in the Old Testament uh, without even thinking twice about it, I want you to associate it with the atoning work of Christ, where he not only breaks the barrier between us and God, he also breaks the dividing wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles, as he puts it so beautifully in Ephesians chapter 2. And that is one of the reasons we must begin to understand that the promises of God, you remember what God told Abraham? He showed him the sky. Your children will be like the stars in the sky, like the sand, sand on the she, seashore. But if you take the population of the Jewish people, they are very small. God was thinking of the whole human race, saved by Jesus by grace through his blood shed on the cross. And that is how we begin to understand what was limited to the Old Testament is now being opened up to us in the New Testament. So please get hold of this. Now we move to the theological necessity. And this is where I want to make an introductory statement. There has been a debate for some years now whether Paul invented Christianity. Now people come up with that statement because of that gross, great doctrinal statements in Paul's epistles and to a lesser degree in Peter and John's epistles, and to a less, still lesser degree in James and Jude. But I want to tell you that what the epistles do, including Paul's gigantic contribution, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the epistle to the Hebrews, which is in one sense a very unique episode because it combines narrative um, picture of the Old Testament along with the systematization. So systematic theology, comes from the epistles. And that's why I've um, given this heading to the section called the theological necessity. Please remember, this is not where what you read in the Old Testament. This comes as a result of reflecting on the narrative through which we went over this period of time. And Paul and the other apostles under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are reflecting on the narrative and coming to these huge conclusions which are taught as systematic theology in our seminaries. 
And of course, my plea to all my seminary friends and students as well, don't put the cart of systematic theology in front of the horse of biblical narrative. The biblical narrative should precede the cart of systematic theology. And that's how I am doing it here. And why was it necessary? I'm dealing mainly with two questions here because after all, our theme for these talks is um, how can Jesus be both man and God? And here I'm going to share with you why it was necessary for Jesus, the intermediary, to be both divine and human. Please get hold of this. Jesus had to be human in order to identify with the human race. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy, you see Jesus identifying himself with all those shameful characters in his genealogy. Getting baptized with repenting sinners. Being called an illegitimate child. Being a friend of publicans and sinners. Being crucified between two criminals. He identifies with sinful humanity. Secondly, in order also to identify with the solidarity of the human race. And this is important. You know, the word solidarity is a kind of our connectedness. Connectedness, uh, I will come to one other aspect of connectedness. How can you say Jesus died for me? We are living somewhere here in India and Jesus died in Palestine uh, so many years ago. And the solidarity in mathematics, <laughs> I don't want to confuse you with more mathematics because there's some more mathematics coming a little later. Uh, but I want to tell you, solidarity is what is called chaos theory. They say, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Beijing, it will create a tornado in Florida. I mean, this is mathematically proven. Don't worry too much about it. But it's basically a connectedness in the universe, which in one sense comes to support the biblical understanding that because humans were set at the top of creation, we and creation are linked together. And when we walk out on God, we drag creation down along with us. So please begin to see that. And that is why Jesus' connectedness with us becomes necessary for us to be purely human. He is completely human. And thirdly, also to completely obey the commandments of God. Whenever once in a while you hear God the Father speaking to Jesus, what does he say? He, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. Not only ultimately he was going to fulfill uh, his call to lay down his body as a sacrifice, but also because during his life on earth, no one could point a finger at him. Jesus could challenge the Jewish leaders in John's gospel, which of you convicts me of any sin? And so you find that he completely obeys the commandment of God. But then, fourthly, I'll be returning to this point later when we come to draw the whole uh, reflection to a conclusion, to elevate the human race. So that Paul could say in uh, Ephesians 2, that we are raised with him, we are seated with him in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers. Here we are struggling through this pandemic, but I want you to notice that uh, positionally, Jesus, the human being, please remember that, we have one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, he's still a human being at the right hand of the Father, pleading for us, interceding for us, but we incorporated in him, because we are in Christ, we are seated with him in the heavenlies, which is why we have a certain authority. But then we go on to the other point, why did Jesus have to be divine? He had to be divine in order to be sinless at birth. Yesterday I told you when someone asked the question, how can Jesus being born of a, a human woman, Mary, be sinless? And of course, the Catholic Church uh, kind of had to come up with a doctrine to make sure that Mary did not have original sin. So they had this doctrine, which is not in the scriptures, that Mary herself was conceived immaculately, the immaculate conception of Mary. 
And of course, after giving birth to Jesus, uh, she remains a virgin, the perpetual virginity of Mary, the ascension of Mary, the coronation of Mary as queen of heaven. And there are a number of Marian doctrines uh, for which, um, let me frankly say, as a Protestant, uh, we go to the opposite extreme of completely shunning uh, thoughts of Mary. Mary was a very special woman. I'm sure there were many uh, Jewish young women who wanted to be mothers of the Messiah. And that privilege was given only to Mary. And there are certain characteristics, but they, you cannot allude all these things that I mentioned now. And so the reformer said that because the conception of Jesus was through the Holy Spirit, he superintended the, con uh, the conception so that Jesus was conceived sinlessly. Another question comes to the mind of people. Jesus did not have a sinful nature. But we have sinful natures. How can Jesus be tempted like we are? It's a good question. But I want to tell you there are two important theological issues here. First of all, Adam was sinless as well at creation. So we must remember, because Jesus is the second Adam, he is sinless in his identification with Adam. And Adam sinned. And therefore, being sinless at birth does not guarantee a sinless life, does not guarantee um, no temptation. In fact, one of the things I would like you to reflect on quickly, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, uh, God will not tempt you above your ability to resist temptation. He's faithful. Now imagine, what was Jesus' capacity to resist temptation? Near infinite. So what would have been the intensity of the temptations that came upon him? Very close to that, sin. The extensiveness of Jesus' temptation. Oh yes, same thing. I mean, you just cannot imagine what he went through. They are summarized for us in the three temptations at the beginning of his ministry. And in fact, all our temptations can be put under those three categories. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust for power. Pride of life is nothing but, uh, and these are the three main things uh, that uh, even Adam were tempted in the Garden of Eden. These are the three things that John mentions uh, in 1 John chapter 2. And these are the three areas in which Jesus fought the serpent and won the battle. And so, but he has to be sinless at birth because he, if he was sinful at birth, hypothetically speaking, he cannot be a perfect sacrifice. You see, this is one of the reasons why the Old Testament becomes very important. The animals which were brought to be sacrificed had to be without blemish. Please remember that. And that is one of the reasons why Jesus had to be sinless at birth. And that is his divinity. Secondly, he had to be, his life had to be precious enough to substitute for the whole of humanity qualitatively. That's why he has to be divine. That's why Paul says, um, again in Romans, you see, um, some may give up a life for a friend. I mean, Tale of Two Cities, you can take uh, so many good novels have been written. But to die potentially for everyone and also for the whole of creation, he has to, his value of his soul has to be precious enough to substitute for the whole of humanity. And thirdly, to be able to encompass past, present, and future in terms of time. The one who comes to die has to be beyond time as well as in time, which is why in the list of uh, the heroes and heroines of faith that you see in Hebrews chapter 11, the concluding verse says that all these great men and women who went, went before us we're actually looking forward to Jesus because their faith gets their validity from the life of Jesus himself. So you find that these are the three important reasons why Jesus had to be both divine and human. Now we come to the third of my main topics, after which there will be two important paragraphs with which I would conclude. Third is the philosophical possibility, and which is really... Uh, the title given in your flyer, how can 
Jesus be both God and man. In fact, um, when uh, I was with the Rabbi Christ Ministries here in India, um, I used to be conducting regular open forums in um, Bombay, the Bombay YMCA near Bombay Central Station once in three months. And Zakir Naik's 12 guys used to come. In the earliest meetings, they'll make a lot of noise and then they started listening quietly. And one of them said, why does Jesus have to be both divine and human? We hold that he's a prophet. I said, for God to communicate to us, the communicating medium has to be both divine and human. Because if it's not divine, we are not hearing God. If it's not human, we will not be able to understand it. See, when I'm speaking to you, what am I doing? I am encoding my thoughts into words using a language software in my head. You hear my words and you decode my words into your thoughts using a language software in your head, which is why communication is such a complicated thing. Because if our two softwares are not identical, I may be talking about a white dog and you are hearing a black cat. Uh, but for God to speak to us, therefore, the communicating medium, not a software, a real be a person, has to be both divine because he's communicating God to us and human because he's speaking to us at our terms. So that is the first philosophical reason why Jesus had to be both divine and human. Secondly, between divinity and humanity, there has to be a um, special relationship, which you see in Genesis 1 verse 26. We are the only creatures in God's universe made in his image. And this is where my other allusion to mathematics comes about. Uh, now we are sitting in front of computers or we are holding phones in our hands and the surface of the phone is a two-dimensional surface and if a cube which is a three-dimensional body has to come into a two-dimensional surface it will have to accommodate itself to two dimensions by becoming a square because the square is the image of a cube in two dimensions now imagine other creatures in this two-dimensional surface this square can surely tell those creatures, he who has seen me has seen the cube. Because two-dimensional creatures cannot see beyond two dimensions. The maximum of a cube that a two-dimensional creature can see is only a square. Because the square is the image of a cube. Similarly, when Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us, Jesus could say to Philip, with all confidence, that he who had seen Jesus had actually seen the Father. Because we humans cannot see beyond human dimensions. But because God made humans in his image, and God is Trinity, one person of the Trinity could become one of us. This is where the incarnation of God comes. Remember what I said earlier. First in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, we see God in human form. We see God incarnate. Now we come to the theological conclusion, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. See, that is the sequence in which we have to read the Bible and draw conclusions, which is why just as this cube can be 100% cube in three dimensions and 100% square in two dimensions, Jesus could be 100% divine in his divine dimensions and 100% human in his human dimensions. So do not think of these two natures as a mixture. See, a mixture, suppose you mix salt and sugar, both are white powders. In the mixture, you cannot have 100% of each. You'll have N% percent salt, 100 minus N% percent sugar. But this is not a mixture. This is a set and a subset that's the closest we can come. Humanity is a subset of the divine which is why uh, God, the Son, can become human, be the Son of Man, and at uh, the same time, be the Son of God. And therefore, it is a mystery and not a contradiction. Those of you who are with me in the Trinity sessions, you would, have remember, you would remember the two metaphors I used. The metaphor for contradiction is a square circle. A square and a circle cannot coexist because the nature of the square and the nature of the circle are different. The doctrine of the incarnation is not a square circle, but it is a pink elephant. 
Now, the nature of the pink color and the nature of elephant as an animal are not contradictory to each other. You can paint an animal pink, an elephant pink, probably after you anesthetize him so that he does not revolt against your painting him. But what is actually happening is that the pink color and the elephant as an animal have not got anything against each other. And that is why the doctrine of the Trinity, God one being, three persons, not one person, three persons, one being three persons, so one at one level, three at another level, is not a contradiction. In the same way, Jesus being 100% divine and 100% human is not a contradiction because God made humans in his image and God is Trinity. So one person of the Trinity can become one of us without, uh, without ceasing to be divine. So that is why. And so these two conditions are fulfilled for us in the, uh, in the Old Testament, the very first chapter, Genesis chapter 1, where in the first three verses we see God, his spirit, and his word, who in New Testament terms constitute the Trinity. And in verse 26, God makes us in his image. And once that is true, incarnation becomes a philosophical possibility. Now I want to tell you that in identifying with us, Jesus' death has two dimensions. It is a, it's a substitutionary death. He died for us. It is also a representative death, which means when he died, we died with him. This is exactly what Paul would tell us in Romans chapter 6. We died with him. We are buried with him. We are raised with him. And as I said in Ephesians 2, we are seated with him in the heavenly places. So please remember that this, is, this has got many dimensions into which I'm not going. I'm just putting it in front of you so that you can think about them. Now I want to refer in passing to two early heresies about uh, Jesus. One was Arianism. One of the bishops of the early church was Arius, who did not consider Jesus to be fully divine. And so any view of Jesus, which gives him something less than full divinity, is an Arian heresy. And the opposite heresy, and you know, all heresies come to you in pairs. C.S. Lewis said many years ago that Satan sends errors in pairs, not one by one, but two by two. And uh, the opposite heresy is docetism, comes from the Greek word dokeo. Dokeo to, is to think or to seem. Jesus looked like he was divine, but he was, uh, sorry, looked like he was human, but he was actually divine. That means his humanity was maya, was illusion, was really not uh, a reality. So you go to two opposite extremes. One, you say that uh, Jesus is only uh, human or he's very, very uh, close to being divine, but not fully divine. Or you say Jesus only appeared to be human, but he was not really human. So we have to hold to the fact that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. I'm sorry I have to rush uh, through that. Uh, I may have to take a few minutes more and no questions possible today. Please send them by email to Mega. Mega, I'm going to take a few minutes because the points I'm going to cover are important and I do not want to encroach upon anybody else's time. So uh, a few reflections here. I've already told you why when God wants to communicate to us, um, the uh, the communicating medium has to be both divine and human. I have also made it very clear to you by the illustration of a Cuban square that uh, God could become human without ceasing to be God in the person of Jesus. But then we want to look at one important verse, Colossians 2 verse 9. Colossians 2 verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. If I were to ask you the question, at what stage of his life did the fullness of the deity come to live in bodily form, I being not a woman, but those of you who are mothers, you would know that it was at conception. 
Remember that the Holy Spirit needed the permission of Mary. When Mary was responding to the greetings of Gabriel, she had to say to him, let it be to me according to your word. And when she said it, in the unicellular zygote that was formed in the womb of Mary, the fullness of the deity came to live in bodily form. So please understand that. That's the most beautiful thing. And as Charles Wesley's Christmas hymn, um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, has a stanza veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. is God who's veiled in the flesh. And that is exactly what happens at the incarnation. But then we must uh, very clearly understand that Um, this is purely, uh, oh, sorry. Jesus is still human. I think it's very important for us to understand that. Because 1 Timothy 2, 5, I think we are all familiar with that uh, verse. Uh, um, we have one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You know, when Paul says Christ Jesus, the anointed Jesus, he's emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. When he says Jesus Christ, almost always, it means that Christ, because he's the anointed Messiah, he is God from God, as one of your songs earlier uh, this evening. So we are beginning to see that in the right hand of God the Father, we have a human being, Jesus. Now I'm going to raise an important question. Is the marriage between Christ and the church, a compatible marriage. Can you advertise this marriage in shadi.com or some such website? Now, what is the nature of Jesus? He is God who has become human. But person, if you quickly read 2 Peter 1.4, 2 Peter 1.4, To these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We have participated in the divine nature. He participates in the human nature at conception. And it is in this humanity he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are participating in the divine nature. So it's actually a coming together of two human divine partners. You know, one of the most beautiful things you will notice is the shape of the New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2, you see the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So we are not going to heaven permanently. We are going to come down when our bodies and souls will be reunited and we will reign over God's new creation. But look at the shape of that city. We saw that yesterday in Revelation 21, verse 16. It is, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Don't confuse it with the other cube that I was talking about. Um, this is the Holy of Holies. The church becomes the Holy of Holies. So what is our motivation to live a holy life here on earth? It's not just to keep our hands clean, our conscience clear. Because ultimately, we are going to be part of the Holy of Holies. Please remember that. And when God dwells in us and we dwell in him, the only human relationship that comes any close to this is marriage, a mutual indwelling between a man and a woman. Let's read quickly Ephesians 5 verses 31 and 32. 31 is Paul quoting the marriage verse from Genesis 2. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. But look this at verse 32. Is, this is a prof profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul simply moves into another dimension altogether. After all, he's, she's, he's talking to husbands there. But after quoting this marriage verse, he says, but I'm thinking of Christ and the church. So you begin to see that this whole story is amazing. From the time he made us in his image in the Garden of Eden. 
until that time we will be caught up and we will be part of the new creation, there is this one continuous amazing narrative. That is what we begin to see. That is what worship is. And all that we draw from it is praise and thanksgiving. That's what I'm going to tell the worship group on Thursday morning. The most of our songs are actually praise and thanksgiving songs, which are important. But worship song is simply admiring the wisdom of God and what Romans 11 the last three verses where Paul just breaks into a doxology. How deep is the wisdom of God past finding out? That is worship, where we remove our sandals and we stand in the holy place. Now quickly, what, is the, what are the implications of the incarnation for the Christian life? First of all, Jesus, after the resurrection, when he comes to the upper room, what does he say? He breathes on them the Holy Spirit. That was not Pentecost, but it was the prefiguring of Pentecost. And he said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Now that becomes very important because when we go into the world, we are going in the same way. That's why in John 14, if we can take verses 22 and 23, Then Judas, not uh, Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now, this is very important. This question, we don't see John 14. This is the third question. First was Thomas, second is Philip, third is Judas, the other Judas. And he says, why is it that you don't show yourself to the world? I mean, this is hugely important. The Great Commission is built on this. Why Jesus, after his resurrection, did not go to Pontius Pilate and say, hello, Pilate, you crucified me day before yesterday, I'm here. Or he went to Annas and Caiaphas and said, you guys sentenced me, look, I'm here. No, no, no. Which is why Judas's question, God will not show himself to the world except through the church. Because when we obey him, the Father and the Son will make our home with us. And through our lives and through our lips, the world will come to hear the message of Jesus. So you are having a kind of a second incarnation. I say this very carefully, reverently, um, that just as Jesus became human through being born of the Virgin Mary, he is now seen in our lives. God will never take back what he did in Genesis 1.28. He wants to rule over the earth through humans. And so he wants to evangelize the world only through the church. Please remember, although he has used in some cases, particularly among our Muslim friends during this month of Ramadan, I hope we are remembering them once in a while. And during the night of power when Muslims pray, God has answer their prayer in some amazing ways, but I will not go into that. Secondly, I want you to read, I want to, someone to have a Tamil Bible with you at this moment, because we are going to look at Philippians 2 verse 6. Can someone, can uh, press and read it in English first, and then I'll see whether this has been correctly translated, because some of our English translations are uh, not right, and I know the Hindi translation, Hindi translation is wrong. I want to see how the Tamil is. Philippians 2, 6, right? Uh, you read in English and then someone will read in Tamil. Who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Very good. Being equal with God. Tamil line about today. Anyone with Philippians 2, 6. Our Devanudaya Rubama Irundum, Devanaka Samadhi. Irundum and the Irundum Dandap. Same mistake in Hindi. Ishwar ke saman hote huye B. That B is not there. You know, I, I'm making a very important point here. This is not a concession. Uh, Jesus, it was, it is a concession as far as we are concerned. But it was a causative thing, not a concessive thing. I'm using two words, which you may not. It was because he was secure in his identity with, with God, 
that he could become human. Not in spite of being equal with God, he becomes human. Because he was equal with God, he could become human. Are you able to see the difference? Oh, this is hugely important. You know, when we send missionaries, you are telling this to a missionary group. When we send people from Tamil Nadu to Bihar, don't go and create a small Tamil Nadu there. Identify with the people there. Identify with the Bengalis and um, begin to enjoy food cooked with mustard oil, which you have never eaten in your life. That is what incarnation is. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, one of my privileges is to have traveled around this country more than half my life. And during my 28 years of service, only two years I was in Chennai. I was outside. And even today, now I'm in Maharashtra, and I can see a couple of my Maharashtrian friends, Suhas and Rachida, are also in this group. You know what I do? I switch on a Marathi channel on Vivid Bharati to listen to Marathi, some of which I know. I want to uh, polish up my knowledge. On one of my tours, to at that time I was posted in Shillong. Uh, our organization was very small, so I was looking after all the seven states. And I happened to be in Imphal, the capital of Manipur. I'd been there on a project, uh, a very difficult project. And there was one gentleman sitting in front of me at breakfast, looking at me rather rudely. You don't look at a stranger like that. And then he came up with an interesting question. Are you a Manipuri Muslim? I said, I'm not a Manipuri, I'm not a Muslim. But then I told the Lord, I'm so happy that I look like a Manipuri Muslim. You know, it's very important. This identification is not something which is superficial. It becomes an internalizing. That's what it happened to Jesus. And that's what he wants us to be. In fact, I have an interesting definition of evangelism, if you want. Evangelism is sharing the person of Christ by the person of the believer with the person of the seeker in the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. It is not just message megabytes. Otherwise, Jesus can say in the 21st century, transmit and make disciples. No, no, no. You can transmit only information. You can't transmit. Even in this Zoom, I'm very happy that I can see some names I can recognize. I can see some faces. But I don't like this impersonal communication. That's not what it was meant to be. Social distancing. I never thought that I'll see the day in my life when a noun called distance will be used as a participle, distancing. So English grammar has gone for a toss. Anyway, that is the world in which we live. So please remember, so we are here looking at the security that you have in Christ. In the month of August, September, two famous women died within eight days of each other. Diana, Princess of Wales, and Mother Teresa. And those days, India today was a, a bi-weekly, fortnightly, once in two weeks. And I remember the picture of both these women, and this is what I remembered. We lived in Calcutta for eight years. Mother Teresa, by her life, and even by her lips, proclaimed the uniqueness of Christ. Look at this huge organization, missionaries of charity. How it has now, it has gone to the third level of leadership. No problems. When she died, all that was in her credit, to her credit, were two cotton saris, you know, white saris with blue border and a plastic bucket. Princess Diana did a lot for the poor in sub Saharan Africa, but she did not have any love in her husband's home, in her parents' home. And she went around frantically trying to compensate for that inner emptiness. And when she died in that horrible, car crash in Paris. She was wearing a ring worth 205,000 US dollars given to her by Dodi Al-Fayed. I want to tell you that it is the inward security which helps you to identify with people who are different from you. Thirdly, we have to begin to live out the word in the flesh. I've already made this point. I'm not going to repeat it. We are to make disciples for Christ, not just converts. That is very clear. And which is why, let's read just one verse, Colossians. No, sorry. 
Second Timothy three fourteen. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. You, Paul is not saying I completed the syllabus. What you have learned, you know from whom you learned it. Timothy's grandmother, Lois, Green's mother, Eunice, and Paul, the spiritual father of Timothy, from whom you learned it. This from whom becomes equally important as what you learned. You know, after all, in a session like this, I can only teach you what you learned. But we need to go more than that. This is not going to make disciples. It is from whom you learned it. And finally, Colossians 1.24, and this is a rather atrocious statement made by Paul. What does he say here? Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now what does he mean by that? As if the suffering of Christ left something out for Paul to fulfill. No, no. Christ's work on the cross was complete in every way. But when you carry that message to the world, you are going to suffer as well. That's what, what Jesus said. You take up your cross and follow me. One of the sad things in today's church is this pain-free understanding of Christianity. It's a very recent advent. Probably in the last 250 years, uh, this pain free Christians, the hyper grace idea, uh, where the leader could even quote from 1 Corinthians 8 He who was rich for our sake became poor, so that we through his poverty may be made rich. He stops there and does not go further to say what Paul is trying to say You who are rich, you open your wallets and give to the poor saints in Jerusalem. That is the purpose of one Corinthians 8. So you please remember that there is something which begins to hurt in us when we are following Christ. You see, Jesus was a public relations risk. Never appoint Jesus as your PRO because he will do a, a lousy job. Because when so many people wanted to follow him, what did he say? Foxes are holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He did not say, come and join the bandwagon, the more the merrier. He didn't say that. In, in today's culture, I think we have to read some of these verses like that. Then only they will impact you. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. So this is the large picture of the incarnation. And let me conclude here. And um, if you think you can go for one or two questions, I'm ready. But otherwise, uh, I've, of course, rushed through this. And... Um, I will be sending you the notes, uh, Mega. Uh, soon after the session is over, I have worked and reworked it uh, last night, this morning, and so on. Mm -hmm.